with Martin Bailey, Senior Fellow of Economic Studies at Brookings and former Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Carlo Cattarelli is Director of Fiscal Affairs at the International Monetary Fund, which is going to start lecturing us more and more, as well they should. And Peter Matheson, Economic Counselor at the British Embassy, which has had a fascinatingly different approach than the U.S. has towards the fiscal situation. So uh, we're going to first have Martin. Oh, and I'm sorry. I do you do you guys have um, powerpoints? Yes. Okay, so if you have powerpoints, yeah, what we're right going to do in order to prevent your head from blocking it is we're just going to have we're going to have the entire panel up, but we're going to have individuals up for their presentations. So thank you so much. Can we can drop the lights here a little bit so we can see? I guess not. Is it possible to drop the lights that are on the screen? Hi, thank you for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Uh, I'm going to say a word about the background on this international piece. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fiscal consolidation within the context of business cycle policies or getting us back to uh, full employment. Uh, and by way of background, I want to say, unlike what I think most popular opinion is, that I think the right things were done in terms of macroeconomic policy uh, as a result of the, of the financial crisis and the recession that, uh, that occurred. Uh, the top was used to recapitalize the banks. Uh, interest rates were dropped essentially close to zero, which uh, uh, helped investment from falling even more than it fell, um, and also allowed uh, banks to be more profitable so that they could get back to uh, their own uh, degree of health. Uh, I also think the stimulus package, which I didn't much like the details of, um, although you know, there were some good things and bad things in it. I think it was the right policy to, uh, again, help us get back towards full employment, even though it uh, imposed substantial budget uh, deficit costs. Uh, despite these measures, which were the right measures, um, the U.S. economy is recovering very slowly. Um, and I'm, uh, I think, like many other economists, uh, have not proven my worth as a forecaster in the last few years. Uh, I kept thinking we were going to get back to a stronger growth path, and it keeps sort of being uh, agonizingly slow. So I think at the moment uh, we're growing about 3% uh, at an annual rate based on the fourth quarter, what looks like coming up for the first quarter and, and maybe the second quarter of, of next year. And while those are better than falling um, GDP and better than uh, even slower growing, it's certainly not the kind of recovery numbers that one would have expected given the severity of the recession. If you go back to the 82 recession or the 75 recession or indeed the Great Depression, uh, those recoveries were much, uh, much stronger. And uh, we're just not seeing that. I think um, a lot of people who said, uh, you know, this time it's different. Uh, we've damaged the financial system. We've uh, chopped away a big chunk of household wealth. So households are going to be more cautious. Those folks were right, and it is uh, slowing the growth. Also, of course, the glut of housing has meant that uh, residential housing, which is normally a source of uh, recovery, uh, is still in, in, in sub substantially bad shape. Now, in terms of what should we do just from a macro policy point of view, uh, I, I would not yet favor, uh, I mean, I guess these days with the, the current constitution of the, of the House, this is not so much an issue, but it was recently. Maybe we need another stimulus. Uh, I did not favor another stimulus, uh, even though the recovery was relatively slow, um, because I don't think we could afford it. Uh, we have had... Um, uh, bad fiscal policies. We uh, essentially looted the Treasury uh, after we ran surpluses in 1999 and 2000. Uh, the Treasury was basically looted. We, uh, we took away uh, all the, um, the powder in the, in the arsenal so that we didn't have uh, enough room to combat a serious fiscal, uh, a serious recession through fiscal policy. We sort of did it anyway, but I think we've pretty much reached the limit of what we can do.
Uh, I also don't think it's time to start a sharp fiscal contraction either. Uh, let's get this recovery going a bit more uh, strongly before we do much in the way of, of additional fiscal uh, contraction. Now, looking at uh, Europe, uh, Europe in some ways uh, got through the recession easier. They have much more generous uh, safety net policies than the U.S. does, and these serve as automatic stabilizers. They did see a big decline in GDP, but nothing like the same decline in employment. Uh, they were also, in a, in a number of cases, uh, direct measures, particularly in Germany, but I think elsewhere, to try to discourage uh, large-scale layoffs, and that also had the result of, of making the downturn less severe. There is a question whether these are, are good policies in the long run, because they do tend to. I mean, Europe has had a history of not having terribly deep recessions, but then having trouble with uh, getting growth after the uh, recession. Uh, so time will tell whether these policies turn out to inflict longer run damage, but they certainly helped um, soften the recession itself. Uh, the ECB is now talking about uh, raising rates, which I think is a mistake. They should uh, keep rates low uh, longer. Uh, yes, there is some growth in Germany driven largely by uh, exports, um, but overall uh, growth in, in the Eurozone uh, the UK and, and so on are pretty, uh, still pretty weak. So I think there should be, um, the ECB should keep its rates lower longer. Now, uh, there is a question of, uh, of the, are they doing fiscal consolidation? How much fiscal consolidation are they doing in Europe? And is that the right thing to be uh, doing right now? So certainly uh, fiscal stimulus, which they didn't do that much of, but again, remember, because of the of the safety net policies, maybe they didn't have to do as much in the way of, of a stimulus. Um, but uh, all right, what about fiscal consolidation that they're, they're now doing? Germany and France have fairly modest programs of consolidation, and, and in Germany, since their growth is doing well, I think whatever they're doing on consolidation is not going to derail uh, their growth. And in France and, and Italy and some other places, uh, much of it is around uh, raising the retirement age and kind of dealing with the budget deficits out in the future rather than right now. Now, obviously, if you're, uh, if you're Robert Barrow or somebody, you think, well, that might affect spending today, but, but uh, generally I think it, the evidence is that it does not. So making pe people uh, have smaller pensions or retire later um, is, uh, is probably not going to change spending today. So I think it's a pretty good way of doing it. Now, having said that, we know we've had people marching in the streets about their retirement age. So politically or socially, it's, it's a tough thing uh, to do, but they are, they are doing it. Now, some of the other countries uh, than, um, than France and Germany are, are in more trouble. Uh, Spain, as we know, Spain just got downgraded uh, uh, announcement uh, just made on, on Spain. Greece is sort of a, almost a hopeless case. It's very hard to see how they will uh, cover their debts, so there's likely to be a restructuring there, and that may pull down the other dominoes as well. Um, and, uh, of course, Ireland, which was very courageous in, uh, in taking on its, um, its debts and in uh, its willingness to stand behind its banks, is sort of paying the price uh, pretty heavily now and, and uh, really was not able to, to follow the policies it wanted to follow. It ran out of money and had to appeal to the EU and the, and the IMF. Uh, I think the evidence of what's been happening in, in Europe, and uh, obviously I'll leave to Peter Matheson to say more about the UK, but I think the UK uh, is, is making that same case, that if you try to do fiscal consolidation when economies are weak, uh, that will slow down the recovery and in the end probably won't get you a lot of deficit uh, reduction. Um, there has been an attempt, both in Europe and, and by uh, academics, Alessina, for example, and I've, I've seen some stuff coming out of the IMF, although I'm not sure the IMF speaks quite with one voice. I'm not sure Olivier is quite on the same page with some of the stuff, other stuff that's written there. But, but um, there is a, an attempt to say fiscal consolidation will actually be expansionary. And I also hear that view in the United States. My... Uh, I, uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to get a lot of uh, counsel and advice from Alan Greenspan, and he takes the view that uh, the, the, the burgeoning deficit in the United States is weighing down on business, and that's why they're not spending, and that's why we're not creating jobs. So we, what we really need to do is to do something about the deficit now. Uh, he was in favor of not uh, renewing any of the Bush 
uh, tax cuts, uh, but rather letting taxes rise as of 2011, and that that would end up being expansionary. Okay, so there are quite a few people, including many whose opinions I respect, who think that uh, we have sort of turned uh, Keynes on his head. Uh, in other words, that uh, fiscal uh, contraction, fiscal consolidation will actually be expansionary from an aggregate demand uh, point of view. Um, I, I don't think the evidence is, is uh, good on that, and I think that what we're seeing happening in the countries that have done this, certainly Ireland is in, in, in pretty bad shape. Uh, the UK is seeing slowing growth uh, as well. So Spain, I think, is, is, is hurting because of the steps it's had to take. So I think the standard sign uh, on uh, fiscal consolidation, which is that it tends to reduce aggregate demand, it takes money out of people's pockets on the first round, I think that still uh, holds. And, and uh, that's been, I think, the conventional uh, view for a long time, and I think it is still valid. Nevertheless, I will go this far and say, if your economy really is in the danger of, of sovereign debt default, uh, then you're in a different ballgame. You, you probably have to do something uh, about that, some kind of restructuring, some kind of uh, fiscal consolidation. All right, I'm running out of time. Um, but but uh, that's, a, that's a different case. And you're probably going to have to pay the price in terms of high unemployment uh, while you make that adjustment, but you, you, you just may not have any choice. And obviously the folks in Greece don't like what they're faced with. They're going to march in the streets about that. Um, but it's, it's not clear that, that there's any real alternative to facing up to, to that medicine. I don't think you can afford in those countries where your sovereign debt is going under to, do, to sustain even your existing fiscal situation, let alone uh, do a, a fiscal expansion. Now, there are a couple of slides in here. And I'll, since I'm running out of time, I'll move uh, past them pretty quickly. Uh, whoops, maybe not quite that quickly. Um, these are basically charts that show the difficult um, fiscal situation in uh, these countries, in the European countries, and uh, uh, in the next one in the United States, and what a painful adjustment it's going to be. So I'm not sure this is going to be news to this crowd, so I'll, I'll go through these. They are available in the hard copy of this. Okay, so I've, I've run out of – I've got one minute, and I'm going to cover my uh, uh, last slide. Okay, so what's the, what's the message uh, on what to do and what not to do? Okay, in my view, uh, we should nurture this recovery. So what we should not do, if we can possibly help it, is have fiscal consolidation now. So I am against any sharp reductions in uh, government spending in the United States or elsewhere in 2011. I think it's more important to keep this uh, recovery going. Now, if you pause a few billion dollars here or there, it's not going to make a big difference, but I don't think there should be a systematic attempt to try to, to uh, balance the budget uh, this year or even move sharply in that direction. The aggregate demand is too weak. Uh, with the risk of repeating myself, obviously, if sovereign debt is in danger, that, then that's a different story. So what about what? So what should you do in the United States? And again, I think um, this group is pretty sophisticated on that. Uh, I would take Bowles Simpson or Domenici Rivlin in a second. In other words, if somebody said, "Would you vote in favor?" I'd say, "Yes, I'll vote in favor." Um, now, Bowles Simpson is a little vague on some of its uh, pieces, uh, but I think it was a very courageous attempt to try to really uh, tackle the deficit in the in the longer run. Uh, and as I say, I would support it. I like Domenici Rivlin a little better. It's a little more specific on what's it going to do on health care, or even there, um, there are some tough uh, T's to be crossed and I's to be dotted. Um, but uh, it, it's a little more specific. I like it a little better. In both of these, uh, there are tax increases, a little more tax increases in Domenici Rivlin, uh, and spending uh, cuts and an attempt to do something about uh, the entitlements. And so I think these are the big decisions that need to be made, and I'm, I support them. I do think, um, you know, I do have still somewhat of a British accent, and I've had uh, people complain when I start being critical of the American people. But I want to tell you, I'm an American, and I'm going to have the same right to criticize anybody else. I think the American electorate uh, is electing the wrong folks. It's electing folks that uh, are not prepared to face reality. They're trying to repeal the laws of arithmetic. And I think uh, we've got to do something about that. I, I just don't think there's a realization. The Tea Party, remember, says no cuts in Medicare, no cuts, cuts in Social Security, and let's balance the budget. Okay, um, you know, 
it's very, you know, virtually impossible uh, to do, even if you eliminate most or all of the rest of uh, government, uh, including, uh, including defense. Uh, and I don't think we should eliminate defense. It's a pretty dangerous world we got out there. So I think we have to have uh, tax increases, and I think we also have uh, to have a major shift uh, away from um, uh, the, the taxpayer-funded fee-for-service uh, coverage that we have right now. We do have a socialized medicine. I mean, Medicare is socialized medicine. Uh, we just run it in a way that other countries do not. We don't put any limits on it. So uh, we, we, you can, this, just been looking at examples, uh, some of the work I do with, uh, with McKinsey on healthcare. You can find ways, uh, because it's been done in other parts of the world, to use standard drugs rather than more expensive drugs, to use um, not as many surgical procedures, and the patients are actually better off, or at least as well off, um, because these treatments are dangerous, and we overtreat in the United States. You could save about $150 billion a year on cancer drugs, for example, if you just use the basic drugs, which are as effective overall as some of the more expensive ones. And we just are not facing up to uh, the willingness to make those kind of cost-effective uh, choices and, fa and, and making, you know, taxpayers, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's no, no death panels, but on the other hand, it's no more taxes. And somehow, we've got to get those two things together. If you want to give very expensive operations to people who probably aren't going to get much benefit from them, then you have to be willing to pay the taxes to pay for them. And uh, let's, uh, let's try to get people to recognize the relationship between those two things. I'm stopping. Thank you. Need to have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm in my presentation. I will discuss. Uh, no, let's try this. Okay, I will discuss uh, essentially two things: the cost uh, of fiscal inaction for growth, the short-term cost of tightening fiscal policy. That was just Martin mentioned those, uh, and then I'm. Um, just to have some concluding remarks about how to balance these two uh, two different costs uh, in um, and how to act, uh, what to do at present. Now, there are, let me start first with the cost uh, of fiscal inaction for growth. Uh, there are two channels through which uh, fiscal inaction can affect uh, growth. The first one is. Uh, Fiscal weaknesses can lead uh, to a debt and financial crisis of the kind that, that we, are, we have seen uh, in some European countries uh, recently. And second, there is, even if a crisis does not happen, there can be long-term implication from holding a very high level of public debt. So let me start first from the risk of um, a fiscal crisis. Essentially, a crisis happens when uh, uh, investors don't have confidence that the government will repay uh, it's that. And uh, this happens when uh, the fiscal policy is regarded to be unsustainable. Now, a standard indicator of uh, sustainability is whether the government can service its debt, namely if the revenues, net and the non-interest payments, are sufficient, which is what we call the primary balance, is sufficient to pay interest on the debt and eventually to repay it, the debt. This figure gives you the information on the horizontal axis, you have the public debt to GDP ratio country by country. The vertical axis has uh, the primary balance, the difference between revenues minus non-interest spending, country by country, adjusted for the cyclical position of the economy. As you can see, most of the countries now are running primary deficits. So the revenues are not even enough to pay for non-interest spending, not to mention to repay the debt. This line, these two lines show you where, under different assumption on interest rates and growth, where the primary balance would have to be to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. And as you can see, with just two exceptions, all countries are well below the primary balance that will be needed to stabilize the debt ratio. And this is where the United States is, which is one of the lowest uh, levels. Now, of course, uh, having this uh, this insufficient primary balance does not mean 
that there will be a crisis. But it means that unless something is done, the debt to GDP ratio will continue rising and eventually there would have to be, there would be, there would be a crisis. Um, and indeed we have uh, received a recently a fresh reminder of uh, that this may happen, that this may happen uh, in Europe. Now, what we don't know, and we have to be clear about this, what we don't know and is how fast a crisis may happen in the presence of a rising debt to GDP ratio. Uh, there have been a, a conventional threshold for emerging economies is about 40-50% of, of GDP. There is not a clear, an equivalent number for advanced countries simply because there have not been enough crises of this sort in advanced countries in the last decades. This, however, does not mean that the debt to GDP ratio can grow forever. Uh, and in a way, risk management principles would require that uh, countries stabilize the debt to GDP ratio before you reach the point when the action, the need for action becomes uh, self self-evident. Now we have a bit more uh, statistical information about uh, the second channel that I refer. These are, if you want to know more about this, these are uh, references to this link between fiscal instability and macroeconomic stability and how a fiscal crisis can, can affect growth. Uh, now let's go to the second, uh, the second effect. The effect that high public debt, even if it does not lead to a crisis, could have uh, on growth over the longer run, what we call potential growth, the long-term trend growth of, of the economy. And here, perhaps we know a bit, uh, a bit more. Um, at an analytical level, high public debt can affect uh, growth because it involves high, essentially higher interest rates. In a way, if debt is held abroad, it also involves a payment of debt to foreigners, so resources that are going abroad instead of being invested domestically. But in general, even if this does not happen, in general, it involves a crowding out of private sector investment. The difficulty of assessing how big these effects are, this interaction between growth and public debt, is that uh, it goes in both ways. It's true that high public debt can lower the growth rate of the economy. It's also, it's also true that a low growth rate of the economy causes the debt to GDP ratio to increase. So one has to take into to try to disentangle this uh, interaction. We have tried to do this. You can do this through econometric technique. The most obvious thing is to say, let's look at what uh, the, let's look at several countries. Let's look at uh, what the debt to GDP ratio is today. Let's look at growth in the next five years, not today, but in the next five years. There are also other econometric techniques uh, to do this. We have tried to do this, and this is what uh, our conclusion is. This is the relation with potential growth. Uh, and public debt at uh, low level, low levels of uh, debt to GDP ratio, like 30% of GDP, higher public debt actually improves growth. But as the debt to GDP uh, increases, uh, there is a negative, increasingly negative effect on growth. So the difference, for example, between a country that is running a debt to GDP ratio of 30% of GDP and a country that is running a debt to GDP ratio of 100% of GDP is about uh, one percentage point per year. Per year, which means that this is a cumulative effect. It means that uh, between these two countries, one with a 30%, the other one with a 100% debt to GDP ratio, uh, after 10 years, the level of GDP will differ by about 10%, which is, which is quite a lot. What is the implication of this? The implication of this is that uh, it will not be sufficient, it will not be wise in the long run just to tend to try to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio at the current level in the United States and in other countries, which is above 100% of GDP or, or more for other countries. It is necessary to try to, to bring it down. And here we get into this, <laughs> my second part of this, the second part of my presentation where the problem is that uh, tightening fiscal policy can uh, can have short-term costs uh, on, uh, on the economy. Martin already mentioned there are some people like Alessina and others who have argued that there is such a thing as uh, Giovazzi before Alessina, all Italians by the way, <laughs> uh, that there is such a thing as an expansionary uh, fiscal contraction. All this is mostly based on the idea that when you tighten fiscal policy, interest rates will decline and with this will stimulate uh, 
private sector demand. The problem with this argument at the moment is that interest rates are already practically zero, so there is not much room to lower them. Uh, our colleagues uh, of the research department have tried to estimate uh, what is the effect uh, of a fiscal tightening, taking all these things into account, and the result essentially is that uh, a one percentage point reduction in the debt to uh, GDP ratio leads after two years to a decline in uh, GDP by about 0.5 percent and an increase in unemployment by about 0.3 percent. This takes into account the possibility that uh, as a result uh, of, uh, of the fiscal uh, tightening, the exchange rate would depreciate. So you get a boost from external demand. If this does not happen, the decline in GDP would even be larger. So bottom line, there are costs for fiscal inaction. And this could be huge over the long run because they accumulate over time. There are also costs which are of a transitory nature, they are temporary when you tighten fiscal policy, but they are not trivial, and so one has to take these two also into account, particularly in a situation in which you are starting when the economy is already relatively weak. So how do you get out of this dilemma? Uh, there are costs if you don't tighten, <laughs> there are costs if you tighten fiscal policy. Um, we have, uh, I mean, not, uh, Olivier Blanchard and I wrote a couple of blogs that you can find on our website, uh, uh, on how to solve this uh, dilemma. Not unexpectedly, the, uh, the, the solution is uh, to avoid a front-loaded fiscal adjustment, to take a medium-term perspective, clarifying what the targets are, not only what the targets are, but what the measures are going to be, and possibly even implementing measures that were going to have a medium-term uh, effect, like reforms uh, in entitlements, and preferably, in, a cost, in the context of strength and fiscal institutions, which will make sure the slippages, well, we make sure that we reduce the likelihood of future uh, slippages. This theme of fiscal institution, I believe, is not discussed enough in the United States and in other countries. We also believe, however, that there is a need for uh, some uh, uh, tangible sign, some initial adjustment, when uh, the economy is sufficiently strong. Now, I mean, words are not, are not sufficient. You need to show some action also. Now, what are countries doing in practice? This is what countries are doing in this practice. This is a bit complicated to, to read, but it's worth uh, spending a um, few seconds on this. On the horizontal axis, you find the improvement in what we call the output gap, which is a measure of how well the economy is doing, of the slack in the economy. If you move in this direction, you have positive numbers, the economy is improving. If you have negative number, the economy is weakening. On the vertical axis, you have uh, the change uh, in, in the deficit, essentially, the improvement uh, in the deficit, the reduction in the deficit. So this is uh, a reduction in the deficit. This is an increase in the deficit. We look at the deficit adjusted for the cyclical effect because this tells you the measures that are being undertaken. So countries that are in this quadrant are countries where the economy is improving and there is some tightening of fiscal policies in 2011. And most countries are there. There are some exceptions. On the one side, you are countries that in spite of the fact that the economy is still weak and is weakening, they have to tighten because they are subject to market pressure, as it was mentioned. You have Greece and Portugal here. On the other side, you have the United States, essentially, which in spite of the fact that uh, the economy is improving, is actually expanding, is adding stimulus to the economy. Uh, this, in a way, uh, it, I mean, one can assess whether this is the right thing or, or not to do at this point. I'm just saying at the moment, this is different from what other countries are doing. And, uh, and this is the last point uh, I want to make. It will make... Uh, if, uh, if policy are indeed the one that we describe here, which is based on the current uh, policy that have been uh, approved, including the fiscal stimulus in December, this will make it very, very difficult to achieve uh, the targets that has been set for next year by the budget, by the, for fiscal year 2012, which would imply a halving of the deficit uh, during the period of this uh, administration. Uh, 
unless there is a tighter fiscal policy this year, at least eliminating this expansion, next year in order to achieve uh, the budget target, it would be necessary to tighten fiscal policy by four percentage points of GDP, which is a huge uh, tightening. Probably a more gradual adjustment that starts already, that avoids at least an expansion this year, it starts already some adjustment already this year, would, be, uh, would avoid uh, this big jump in 2012. Let me conclude with one, with one caveat. Uh, we need to acknowledge uh, our uh, ignorance about many aspects uh, of, of this issue. Uh, I, I gave you a number, of num <laughs> I gave you many numbers as if they were certain. No, there is a lot of uncertainty about these things. The point, however, that I want to find, the point I want to make is that this uh, lack of knowledge, can, uh, decision has to be taken. And this lack of knowledge cannot be taken as an excuse for lack of action. Thank you very much. Right. Um, thank you to Anne for inviting me to this, and thank you very much to Martin and Carlo for those interesting remarks. Uh, when you work for an embassy which is conducting a bold and ambitious fiscal policy, you tend to go around and do quite a lot of events where uh, fiscal policy is the uh, is the centre of the discussion and become a bit of a poster boy for uh, fiscal consolidation. So um, I've carefully selected my remarks today. I've tried to focus much more on fiscal solutions and how we're going about solving the United Kingdom's fiscal problem rather than talking about the underlying problem itself. I don't think I really need to convince anybody in this audience today that there's an issue there, an issue that needs urgently to be addressed. But just to start and just to set the scene so you understand where we're coming from, in the United Kingdom in 2009, the central government was spending around 48% of GDP. That compared with tax revenue, which was around 37-38% of GDP. So we were left with a deficit of around about 10% of GDP, a historic high, certainly a, certainly a post-war high. From that starting point, 10% of GDP, where are we going? The coalition government came in last May and set as its top priority uh, serious fiscal consolidation. It wants us to get down to a deficit of around about 1% of GDP by 2015. How is it going to do that? Around about 75% of that consolidation will be delivered by spending reductions, with the remaining 25% coming from various forms of taxation increases. And to put that in historical context, uh, obviously the, the government that Margaret Thatcher uh, controlled in the 1980s, uh, it was another administration which was serious about cutting back the size of the state, reducing deficits uh, and, and cutting back the size of government. Margaret Thatcher's government between the years 1982 and 1989 reduced the size of central government from 45% of GDP to 34% of GDP. So actually a slightly bigger uh, reduction in the size of government uh, in that area. But again, to put that in context, that was over a period of seven years, whereas the current government's plans were over a period of five years. And it was also helped by quite an ambitious privatisation programme, the selling of national industries into the private sector, which of course yielded quite a lot of revenue uh, for the government. But at the same time, I think it's important not to lose sight of what we're doing. A lot of people obviously um, make quite a lot of noise about how ambitious this is um, and about how big uh, the reductions in, in state spending are going to be. And the government is certainly under no illusions that that is the case. But where we get to in five years' time is a state which takes up, as a share of GDP, what it took up around about 2003 and 2004. So I think it's important not to, to lose sight of that dimension. So just to focus a bit more on exactly uh, what the government is doing, overall the reduction in state spending over the next five years works out around about $130-$140 billion. That is from overall spending of around about $700 billion and is part of an economy of around about two and a quarter trillion dollars. Before I say what it is the government is doing to, uh, to cut back on that spending, uh, I think it's just worth underlining what the government is not doing. And this echoes Ruth's points earlier about cuddly fiscal pandas, I think. Some things have been protected by the government and prioritised by the government. So there's going to be no reductions in national health spending, a very important part of, uh, of the UK national fabric, I think. There will be no reduction in foreign aid spending. And also uh, the government has made sure that it's protected school spending. So there's certainly things within the budget which have been ring-fenced and which have been protected. 
What are the things which are being cut back on? Well, around about half of the overall reductions come from savings in departmental budgets. Some of these are very, uh, very, very ambitious. So, for example, uh, local communities, a 50% reduction in uh, the, the running costs of that department, 29% reduction in the Department of Environment's budget, and the department I'm from, the Department of the Treasury, also down by about a third. So really big numbers. And I think in the case of most departments, those numbers are at least in double digits and probably in the region of about 20 to 30%. And government and government departments right now are doing the important, difficult and hard work to think about how they can deliver that realistically over the course of the next five years. In addition to that, we've made uh, we're going to make important savings on welfare spending, which probably contributes around about a fifth of the overall savings. Some of that will probably cost money in the short term. For example, a lot of people in the United Kingdom are in, in, on incapacity benefits, a lot more now than, than was the case 10 or 20 years ago. So there will be a, a very much concerted effort to try and get them back into work uh, and schemes to do that. The various schemes that we have, um, in addition to those to get people off unemployment and into work, they will be simplified and unified. Um, and hopefully from that process, there'll be uh, welfare savings. And finally, if there's any free lunch in a list, I don't think there is, but as a result of having uh, lower debts over the next few years and as a result of having lower deficits and also as a result of having lower interest, uh, interest payments uh, will be lower, there's about 10% uh, of the savings come from lower interest on uh, on government debt. Right now, what we pay, spend on government debt interest equates to roughly what we spend on schools in England, so it's certainly not insignificant. Um, I think of all the questions that people ask me, one of the questions they ask me most prominently is, if that's the case, where is the, the growth in the United Kingdom going to come from? And maybe that's something we can we can address later on. But obviously, as a diplomat in the United States, I get asked quite often about the compare and contrast with the uh, United States experience. Um, and while there are obviously very important differences between the two economies, there are also important similarities between the two economies. So this chart here pl plots our budget projections with the, uh, the budget projections that the president included in his budget uh, back in February. And as you can see, just by glancing at it, the path uh, of the two cities, the United Kingdom deficit and the US deficit, aren't actually that different. If you compare where we are in 2011 and where both economies plan to be in 2013, both are planning to roughly half their overall deficits. So actually we're going in the same direction. There's a difference uh, in 2015 at the end of around about one percentage point in terms of the deficit. The United Kingdom's one had been lower. Um, but at the same time, there are important similarities, which I think is important not to lose sight of. You could, of course, um, add to that that the uh, projections that I show here for the United Kingdom are baked into our legislation. They've been passed and into law, whereas in this country, the debate about the budget is still carrying on. Um, but I think it's just important to see things from that perspective and to realise that there are differences and similarities. I think uh, some other differences that I might draw out are, it's very striking to us in the United Kingdom how important the unemployment dimension is, I think, to the debate in the United States and how talk of fiscal stimulus, or at least not being too radical on fiscal consolidation at this stage, uh, unemployment is always an important part of that conversation. The reserve currency in the United States uh, is obviously beneficial um, in terms of how early or how late um, you need to think about your fiscal policy is a commonly made argument. But one thing I just wanted to draw out from the UK experience is the importance of frameworks and rules. They've been a very important part of UK fiscal policy really since about the mid to late 1990s. And I think that's even more so uh, so the case now. Essentially, if you have frameworks and you have rules and you have targets, then it really gives your policy an anchor, which you can hook it to. And then you can have a good open debate about how you're going to achieve those goals if, if you can agree on them. And just three things I want to pull out um, from the framework that the coalition government has put in place to, to achieve fiscal consolidation. We haven't said very much today about economic forecasts. We've talked about spending and tax revenue. But to get your fiscal policy right, you need to get your economic forecasts right. And one of the um, perhaps flaws of the previous government's um, fiscal agenda was uh, they quite frequently got their growth forecast wrong. And if you get your growth forecast wrong, you will overestimate how much revenue you're going to take in and underestimate how much you're going to spend. So it's important to have a very credible, sensible economic forecast. So the first thing this government did when it came in was it said, as a government, we will no longer make economic forecasts. It will be done by an independent body, the Office of Budget Responsibility, headed by a gentleman called Robert Choate. 
they will give forecasts to us and our fiscal projections will be run off them. So hopefully that will put the uh, forecasts and the projections on a sounder footing. Secondly, what the government is really aiming for, I talked about how the overall deficit would come down to 1% GDP, but the fiscal mandate itself and the central goal in all this is to get the cyclically adjusted current balance down to zero. That is, what's the deficit going to be once you've corrected for the economic cycle, once you've allowed for the fact that perhaps there's some capacity in the economy that could be taken up and which will pay more tax revenue once it gets back into employment, those types of things. Um, and in this country, people tend to just talk about the overall deficit. Uh, the cyclically adjusted deficit tends to get uh, overshadowed or not really addressed. I was going to say that uh, it's almost impossible to find such statistics, but actually Carlo just had included them in uh, in his part of uh, in his remarks. Uh, but that's key to what we're doing. So we're thinking, well, let's correct for the economic cycle. Let's allow for the fact that we have a bit of recovery to do and focus on that. And then finally, we're complementing that fiscal mandate with a target to reduce debt. And I think debt as a proportion of GDP peaks at around about 70% coming down thereafter. Sorry, I forgot to put up the uh, text of the slide. So um, there's also three important principles that uh, the government enshrines in its fiscal policy. One of those is growth, that if you're cutting government spending, that you should do so in such a way that it's not detrimental to growth and preferably enhances growth. Secondly, reform. If you're thinking about government spending, then you should use that opportunity to reform government and make it more efficient. And finally, fairness. And both Debbie and John in the previous uh, session were talking about fairness uh, from the perspective of, uh, of the US budget. And that is something that is very cent central to the UK government's fiscal plans uh, as well. So this chart here shows by income group from the, uh, the first quintile to the fifth uh, quintile just how much these different groups are losing in terms of overall benefits as part of the government's fiscal package. And as I hope you can see from this, those on the lower end of the uh, income scale in uh, the first quintile lose overall a lot less than those in the uh, in the fifth quintile and you know, there's various different uh, policies which underpin that result for example in the uk we have something called child benefit which up until now has not been means tested it's been universal so one of the things the government has done has decided not to pay it to higher income groups so that's a very important principle and as i say one which i think echoes debbie's and john's comments earlier finally how is the economy doing? Uh, I mean, Martin already alluded to the fact that uh, our economy had um, a rather disappointing final quarter. We're having a debate right now about how much of that was determined by the weather and how much by other factors. I think ultimately we're going to have to wait and see about that. Um, I would say that the survey data that we have in the United Kingdom, the private survey uh, data, the ISMs and things, that's been encouraging. It suggests a rebound in the first quarter of the year. But the forecasts that we have, really, there is a bit of consensus, I think, that people expect the economy to grow around about the 2% mark in 2011. One good thing about that is these forecasts take into account fiscal consolidation. So, uh, you know, these aren't uh, fiscal consolidations that are risk to these forecasts. It's very much baked into those projections. Um, but the final thing I would just say is that this is a five-year process. We have five years uh, to get the deficit down to 1% of GDP. Uh, as we're forecasting, I don't think we can judge it on the basis of one quarter or even two quarters or one year. It's something that we unfortunately have to judge over uh, the medium term, and that is what we will do. That's it. So I, I spend a lot of time with people who are having conversations about how you get people and the general public more interested and attuned to thinking about fiscal policy. And I have a new idea, which is have it delivered in an attractive foreign accent. <laughs> and Because I say debt to GDP ratio really sounds a lot better in an Italian accent or a British accent. <laughs> so, so, so that's my, my new plan. Um, there, there were some fascinating numbers and examples there and the, the British experience and the potential benefits of it and the, poten and the potential disappointments of it are fascinating. But I wanted to start with Carlo and ask, you, you had this kind of chilling statement about if we do not contain the expansionary policy that's embedded in the tax package that was agreed on last year. 
about the consequences for us. And I just wanted to ask about that. It's a, it's a short-term thing and a little bit a field from the larger question that we're addressing. But since that's not going to happen, you know, the, the one thing we can be sure about in America is that a, a tax cut given in a bipartisan agreement is not going to be taken away anytime soon. Would you talk a little bit then about how you see the impact of the current um, fiscal discussion, Martin? I was you were talking about the risk of a sharp retrenchment. I don't know if sixty one the sixty one billion that we're talking about counts as sharp, but I'd just really be interested in all of your perspectives on the 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 short term implications of the current debate. I mean, thank you. This is a very good, uh, very good question. The, uh, my answer would be that uh, in uh, in the short run, unlike other countries, the United States have a lot of credibility. Interest rates are very low. So, um, in our baseline, in my baseline scenario, nothing much is going to happen in the short run, except that the deficit will continue to rise and will continue to rise much faster than abroad. Now, there is such a thing as tail risk. I mean, there are tail risks. One cannot deny it. Things happen, unlikely events happen, and these are the things that then exposed have the largest cost. And if there were a uh, loss of confidence uh, in, uh, in the United States or in Japan, which is another country in a relatively similar situation, that would have huge costs, not only for this, this economy, but for the rest of the world. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen. But it's one of those theories like, uh, I don't know, uh, nobody thought that Lehman Brothers would happen, for example. So one has to design policy taking into account also these uh, tail risks. I think, however, that uh, the main risk is uh, the one that I was also referring in my presentation, essentially bringing the debt-to-GDP ratio to a level, a sort, sort of getting comfortable with the debt-to-GDP ratio of 110, 120% of GDP, and uh, thanks to my Italian accent, uh, I'm very familiar with a case uh, like <laughs> this. So in a way, when I was showing you numbers, uh, econometric estimates, statistical uh, estimates showing that uh, high debt is associated with low growth, I also have in mind two uh, countries that suffer from this in the last 20 years. One is indeed Italy, the other one is Japan, two countries with very high public debt and low growth. I think that uh, the United States, the, the big risk in the United States is that it turns into, it suffers from this kind of syndrome. Um, I thought your, your chart was very interesting showing the effect of um, uh, large debts on potential GDP. I'd be interested in knowing how you separate out the fact that low potential growth might lead you to high debts, which I think is what's happened in Japan, mm -hmm. as opposed to the causality that you put on it, which is that the high debt leads to low potential. A and presumably there was a, an attempt to do that, but I, I, I'm not quite a believer yet on uh, the causality in that, uh, in that chart. Nevertheless, uh, there is a point at which um, interest rates will start to rise, um, and we will, get, um, uh, we will get a financial crisis. I don't think it'll happen this year or next year, so I think we have room. Uh, to finance the deficits that are ahead of us in, in 2011 and probably into 2012, and the key thing is to do something about the longer run. You mentioned that taxes, um, you know, that was one of my uh, complaints here about electing the wrong people. I think it's just crazy that we uh, have this pledge that we can't raise taxes. Um, I, I, I'd be bi bipartisan uh, here, by the way, and say it's very difficult to get the Democrats to really look seriously at c containing um, uh, Medicare spending. But the fact that we have this prohibition on raising taxes, I think, makes it makes it impossible to get to a reasonable solution. Now, even if you don't raise income taxes, uh, there are other things you can do. And both of the uh, proposals, Bowles, Simpson, and Domenici Rivlin, suggest you get rid of a lot of the deductions. So the deduction for health care, uh, health insurance. And uh, John McCain proposed that, and I was very sorry that uh, Obama uh, ran against that, because uh, I think that's something we should do. There's no, it, it's, a, it's a subsidy to the rich. Uh, you can't get rid of it overnight, but you can cap it so that it gradually goes away. Similarly, interest on 
on mortgages and interest deductibility generally, which I think contributed, it was one of the factors contributing to us getting into a financial crisis because it encourages overborrowing. So I think if we could cap and gradually phase out the deductibility of mortgage interest, a lot of other countries don't have uh, deductibility of mortgage interest and they still have fairly high home ownership rates. So those are big chunks of money. Um, Domenici Rivlin proposes a sales or value added tax. Um, Doug Holtzikan, whom I debated about this issue, said we don't want to set up a whole new sector, a whole new uh, tax, value added tax, all the administrative difficulties. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I think it, you know, a sales tax that was integrated with uh, the sales tax that already exists in a lot of states, I think uh, potentially could be a good thing. Um, let's raise the tax on gasoline to five dollars a gallon over a period of time. Not today, but 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 over time, I, I think that would be a double benefit, reducing gas consumption and and uh, um, also raising revenue. Now, are these tax proposals feasible? Um, you know, probably not. But at some point, I think. Uh, we will find out that we cannot keep running these deficits and we've got to do something. And I just hope, whether it comes through a financial crisis or just a rise in interest rates, that on the one hand, uh, liberals will, will realize that we've got to contain health care costs and conservatives will realize we've got to raise revenues. Um, good. That was a perfect segue to my quick question for Peter, which is, Tell us a little bit about, we've been speaking so much about health care costs and rising health care costs as such a driver of our projected deficits in the future. I, obviously, the, the public health service is probably the third rail of British politics, like despite what John had to say, as Social Security is to us, and so it was protected from the cuts. What has been the experience with the growth of health care costs in the public health service, and how does that affect your fiscal future? Uh, I mean, I don't have the I don't have the exact arithmetic in in front of me, um, but I mean, the previous government, the Labour government, one of its priorities alongside education was to increase spending on health care, um, and I'm not sure just exactly where we are as a share of GDP, but um, it's gone up quite significantly since 1990. Eight and certainly since the uh, since the start of uh, of the last decade, some of that will be increased costs, but I think by far the vast majority of, of it is in terms of increased outputs and outcomes. Um, and that was a very key part of the election debate that we had last year. That the Conservatives, led by David Cameron, that they promised if they would get in that they would protect that and they would do nothing to reverse that. And in fact, they would add to spending on health, and that is uh, and that is what uh, what they are doing. So, I mean, we have a different system, so we don't have the same problems that you have in this country. Um, I mean, one, one thing I would say, though, as part of that, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't savings that can't uh, can be delivered on the administrative side. So we have a Department of Health in the United Kingdom government, and they're not immune to the cuts. But um, that's only a tiny fraction of the overall spending uh, on health. In terms of frontline mm -hmm. delivery, that's overall been protected. Uh, let's see if we can squeeze in a few questions. Uh, yes, in the way back. Yes, we're talking about the uh, debt, but we haven't really mentioned uh, who owns the debt in Japan. First of all, I have a very positive current uh, account. The debt is also owned by the people. Uh, instead of putting the money in a mattress, they buy the post office bonds, and the debt is carried at very, very low interest rates. And the yen is one of the uh, strongest currencies in the world, where the U.S. debt, not only do we have a very, very high negative current account deficit, uh, but our debt is owned a lot by the government debt, is owned a lot by foreign countries, especially China, who uh, buys our debt, the government puts the money into the uh, economy and then everyone buys the Chinese imports. So I think that uh, should be mentioned. The, uh, the other thing is we're talking about deficits, but should we be talking about stimulus plan? I, I think a lot of economists say we've got to carry deficits. There's not enough purchasing power. So it really isn't a question of how effective is the stimulus plan. It stopped the bleeding, but it's also just help the uh, 
uh, corporations increase their profits without cutting the unemployment. So isn't that really where the discussion should be? Let me take a quick crack at that. Uh, you're absolutely right about Japan's debt versus our debt, and that's an important distinction, and, and why uh, you know Japan has been able to run uh, debt at a very high level of, of GDP without seeing the kind of uh, crisis that you might see elsewhere if it was a foreign-owned debt. Now, the only thing I would say in amelioration for the United States is we've done a heck of a job at selling our debt at very low interest rates. So we've, we've uh, sold the Brooklyn Bridge over and over. Uh, um, I mean, this is, we're selling debt and, you know, paying 1%, 2%, uh, very low rates of interest on it. it. It's really quite remarkable if you look at what happens to our net foreign indebtedness. In other words, how each year after year we become more indebted. And you compare that to the current account deficit. In other words, how much in principle we've been borrowing from overseas. And it varies by year. It depends whether the dollar goes up or goes down. But by and large, we have done an incredible deal. Now, I don't think we can keep on doing that, and I don't think we should keep on doing it. But it does mean that if we can ever get our act together, uh, we are not sort of burdened in per perpetuity by this uh, debt, which has been borrowed on uh, very favorable terms. This issue of Japan is very interesting. Indeed, the, the ratio of uh, a Japanese debt held domestic is about 95%. The ratio of U.S. debt held domestic is about 50%. But there is something that bothers me. For, there are two things that bother me. For how long, first of all, this will last uh, in Japan? And relatedly, I think this uh, also reflects a situation in which uh, investors in Japan, they are not willing to take risks. They're not willing to invest. They're not willing to invest abroad. So it's also a situation that condemns the country to low growth. So the question is, is this situation in which a lot of public debt, again, accumulate associated to a situation in which the animal spirits are very low and therefore there is no growth? Ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I'll address this to Mr. Bailey, but the other gentleman can please um, uh, chime in with the answer, I wrote this down before you, I think you asked the question. What happens when the interest rates rise and then what will happen to the bond market as localities, local and state governments go after bond monies to pay for infrastructure projects, et cetera, in the cities and states, whether it's transportation or what have you. So what's going to happen to the bond market when interest rates rise? Thank you. Um, well, Nuria Rubini, one of our Italian-American uh, well-known economists, uh, forecast a financial crisis and has gotten correctly a lot of credit for forecasting a financial crisis. Uh, he didn't exactly forecast the crisis we had. Uh, he forecast that uh, the, the process you just described, which is that people would stop uh, wanting to buy or the, the demand for, for uh U.S. Uh, denominated assets, dollar denominated assets would not be sufficient and consequently interest rates would have to rise in order to uh, keep selling them and there would be a drop in the dollar and a very large uh, rise in interest rates. And that puts you in a very nasty dilemma domestically. Interest rates are uh, arising. It does allow you to e export more, but typically that's a very slow reaction and the high interest rates uh, will tend to uh, push you towards uh, a recession. So that's something we want to avoid. Now, interest rates will rise if the economy keeps growing. So the sort of good I increases in interest rates, interest rates are, are reflecting strong growth. But if we get high interest rates without strong growth, then I think that's a very unfortunate situation. And that's the, the thing that could potentially prompt uh, Congress to do something about it because they really would be faced with the fact of the consequences of their actions. Yeah. Now, in terms of the infrastructure, I have, I'm a bit skeptical about an infrastructure. Um, you know, I'm the Bernard Schwartz senior fellow, and, and Bernard Schwartz um, is a big fan of infrastructure spending, so I'm, I'm not necessarily his favorite uh, a person he sponsored. Um, he wants a big infrastructure spending, and I just don't think we have the money to do that. And I think the idea of a green bank and an infrastructure bank it's sort of we're loading onto the government debt more and more and more, and I just don't think we can do that. We need some of the infrastructure. I mean, we don't want the bridges to fall down and the roads to fall down, and I think there are some areas. I don't particularly want high-speed trains, but but we do need some improvements in, in the infrastructure. We've got to find a way for the private sector to fund that. Anybody else? What happens when no, I mean, this rates? issue of interstate right. is a critical one, and... Uh, 
more or less we know numerically with the debt to GDP ratio of 100% if interest rates go up by 1% uh, the deficit increases by another uh, by another 1% and this again puts pressure on interest rates and it can it can uh, impi it can rapidly uh, increase uh, so when when we look at the deficit now and the debt ratio now we need to keep in clear account that this is in the context of exceptionally low interest rates uh, for the United States and for the other countries. That's one of the reasons why emerging markets now are benefiting from what we call tailwinds. Uh, their fiscal performance is good, but it's in the context of very favorable conditions, low interest rates, uh, high commodity prices, high asset prices, which will not last forever. Great. I think we probably need to break for a quick lunch, and then we're going to... Um, be uh, in the real world of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah,